Okay, we're going to be in, yeah, what are we here for? Right, yeah, we're going to be in uh, Matthew chapter 8. <laughs> Matthew chapter 8. So uh, why don't we go ahead and uh, stand and we will read the word of God together, verse 1 through 4. When he came down from the mountain, great crowds followed him. And behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, You can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded for proof to them. All right, this is the word of the Lord, and you can be seated. Um, Philip Yancey, popular Christian author, I'm sure a number of you have read his books, he co-authored a book with Dr. Paul Brand uh, called uh, Fearfully and Wonderfully Made. And Dr. Brand served as a medical missionary in India, uh, with the team that treated modern-day leprosy. And one of the important discoveries that his team made was why it is that leprosy uh, just disfigures the extremities of its patients and why many leprosy patients would be like missing toes and fingers and things like that. And they found out that the disease destroys the protective sensation of pain. So basically, it's like it destroys nerve cells. So you could have your hand on an extremely, like dangerously hot stove and have it not register as dangerously hot. So you just keep it there, you know, until it does irreversible damage. Or like a leper may have a, an open wound and then you have uh, a rat that would come in the night and nibble away and eat at the wound and there would be no nerve sensation to wake you up. And, and so, anyway, it's a, it's a very fascinating book, but, but uh, Nancy uh, recounts in an article uh, a little bit of his interaction with Dr. Brand. He says, leprosy is a lonely disease, Brand told me. In many countries, its victims are kicked out of their homes rejected by the community, and sometimes forced to live outdoors. And he told me of one memorable encounter. I was examining the hands of a bright young man, trying to explain to him in my broken use of his language that we could halt the progress of the disease and perhaps restore some movement to his hand. I expected him to smile in response, but instead he began to shake with muffled sobs. Have I said something wrong? I asked my assistant in English. Did he misunderstand me? And she quizzed him and replied, no, doctor. He says he is crying because you put your hand around his shoulder, and until he came here, no one had touched him for many years. You know, we're entering into a, a stretch in Matthew's Gospel that's very heavy on the miraculous deeds of Jesus. And we spent all of our time last week exploring uh, the purpose to Christ's miracles. Like, what was God really saying to us and is saying to us through the supernatural occurrences going on with His Son? Like, why did God multiply so much miraculous activity with, with Jesus. And we saw that it was not random and it had a very strategic purpose attached to it. And so now we'll start getting into some of the actual details of those miracles themselves. And of course, the first one Matthew records for us in detail is the healing of a leper. Now, I ought to tell you that it is a little unclear um, what disease or diseases the word leprosy designates in Bible times. Um, many people would say that the word has much more breadth than just what we would modern day leprosy or Hansen's disease, that it would be uh, a word that would include any number of skin maladies or spreading skin diseases. 
would get kind of lumped under the rubric leprosy in Old Testament times. But you'll notice something very peculiar about the way the leper does the ask. Because when he comes to Jesus, he doesn't like kneel before Jesus and say, Jesus, if you will, you can make me well. Or Jesus, if you will, you can have me healed. Right? He says, Jesus, if you will, you can make me, what's that word? Clean. You can make me clean. That's a very strange word if you're not familiar with the Old Testament background. And so we'll go into the Old Testament background to really appreciate what's going on here. And, uh, you know, if you go and read the law of Moses, you encounter all of these ritual regulations in God's law that classified things as clean for you or unclean for you. Or there would be things that would cause you to be put into a state of ritual contamination and therefore unfit for the presence of God in worship. And so, of course, you wanted to avoid the kinds of things that would cause you to become ceremonially defiled and therefore not in an acceptable condition for participating in the covenantal worship life of the community until you underwent ceremonial purification again. And it was never like a hopeless thing, right? There's all kinds of guidelines and protocols for how to get out of a state of uncleanness and back into a condition of ritual cleanness again. But one of the hard things for the modern reader is when we go back and you start encountering the cleanliness code, like these are some of the hardest parts of the Bible for us to read, aren't they? Come on, just... Cough it up and admit it, right? Like when you got a Bible reading plan and then it's throwing you into Leviticus 13 and 12, like it's just hard to get like super jazzed up about that. And you really have to plow through that as a discipline. And you'll notice when you go through those things that, that a lot of things that God is associating with uncleanness are not matters of intrinsic evil. They're not like moral absolutes. In fact, many of them, would, we would consider them to be very neutral things that have nothing to do with moral absolutes or like root level spiritual evil very ordinary familiar things even things that we can't help that got associated with ritual uncleanness i'll just give you a few of them you probably know some of them like like let's say you had a house that had spreading mildew in it and that house got put under quarantine it was shut up and you walked into that house you would contract ritual contamination. Well, I'm just going to tell you, there's nothing intrinsically evil about walking into a house that has mildew. Just, just know that. Uh, um, uh, when a woman was on her menstrual cycle, you can't even help that, right? She would be considered ritually unclean. A man who had a nocturnal emission would be considered ritually unclean. If you came into contact with a, a corpse, you would be considered ritually unclean. Of course, there's this huge dietary code of kosher laws about what foods are clean for you versus what foods are unclean for you. And we just want to know, like, what is... now? And, and to be fair, God associated matters of moral absolutes with uncleanness as well. And God associated root-level spiritual evil things with uncleanness of, as well. But there's a lot of things in there that are very neutral that get attached to ritual impurity. And we kind of want to know, like, God, what is, what is up with that? Well, one of the things that God was doing was adopting that as a teaching method. Full of visual aids and symbolic op- object lessons to help people understand what it takes to draw near to this God. And that in order for me to come near to this God and really get into His presence, my life has to be put into an acceptable condition. And so God took all sorts of ordinary things and made symbolic object lessons out of them to teach people that you need to be clean, to be and cleansed, to be in the presence of this God, because God is a very holy God, right? He's a pure God, a pristine God, undefiled by anything dark God, that God. 
And there's this massive difference. And we live in a very impure and corruptible world. And so there's this massive difference between God and His incorruptible glory and us in our fallen, corruptible uh, state. And so I, in order for me to hold effective communion with God and get into God's presence, I have to have my life placed into a clean condition or an, an undefiled position. Otherwise, if I try to draw near to Him with my uncleanness on me, I risk His wrath upon me because God is light and in them there is no darkness at all and He will not tolerate evil. And so God was driving that, driving that, using everyday ordinary things, driving that into the psyche of His people so that it would just be in their mindset as they walked through life with him. In fact, and the more I think about it, it's a brilliant teaching method that he came up with. So, for the purposes, and by the way, there are other reasons for the cleanliness code in Israel as well. I won't go into all of them, but I think that's one of the biggest ones, and it fits quite well with our story today. Because what we need to know is that God linked ritual impurity with leprosy. And so that made leprosy this devastating diagnosis. Because the law of Moses required that if the priest pronounced you leprous, then you had to go dwell outside of the camp. You had to live apart from everyone other than other lepers, that's, right, that's where you got the leper collar. You had to live apart from everyone until your leprosy resolved itself. And you were required to kind of dress yourself down to kind of let your appearance go, kind of let your appearance become unkempt. And if anyone came too close to you, you had to cup your, your hand over your mouth and cry out, unclean, unclean. Right? So you have this whole way of life that's now built around keeping people away from you because you're dirty. And you don't want them to contract your ritual defilement. Right? And so this was, this was a devastating diagnosis because it, like, you're living out a social death now. You're cut off from the community. You're cut off from the normal rhythm of your family. You're cut off from your career. You're cut off from the worship life of the community. I mean, you are now like living a social death. Now, I just want you to indulge with me for a little bit. What will that do? What do you think that would do to a person's self-image if their whole way of life is built around keeping people away from you? and you keeping away from other people because you are unclean. I'm just trying to think about that. Like what, what would that do to a person's feelings of self-worth? I mean, just I, I can't even describe the deep sense of shame that probably w- would be happening around that. You know, right? So when, when this leper comes to Christ and he, and he says, Lord, you can... You can make me clean. Like this is way more than just like moving me from sickness to health. They're like Jesus, you can, you can end this nightmare. Like you can take me from this this lonely life of isolation to community participation again. You can take me from feeling cut off from the presence of God at the temple where I'm forbidden to be to being able to go back to the temple and be found hoping in the presence of God again. And who knows when the last time this leper went up to the temple because that is not something that he could do. But something greater than the temple is here. And you could argue that the leper now kneels before an even better temple. The fullness of deity bodied on earth. And the true connecting place between God and mankind. And he sees by faith, give me a second here, and he sees by faith that there is a new spiritual force afoot 
in Jesus that reverses the old way of things. What was the old spiritual force with the cleanliness code in Old Covenant times? Let me tell you, is that uncleanness always wins. That when the unclean comes into contact with the clean, it makes the clean unclean. But now there's something new going on. There's a new principle that is powerfully at work in Christ where someone who is clean is able to uncontaminate the unclean and make it clean again. And he sees that by faith. And he says, that's why he does the ask. Jesus, you can make me clean. So, Verse 3, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. What a strategic thing for Jesus to do. We know Jesus healed many people with just the word. But he made a point of touching this man. When's the last time this man's been touched? Remember, his way of life is built around not being touched. And Jesus knows that. And so he reaches out and he touches this man. And by touching this man, he is meeting this man in the very place where this man is most unacceptable. And bringing his transforming touch to that man's life that will take all the alienation away. Know that about your Savior, that Jesus will touch the people that nobody else wants to touch. Jesus will get close to the people that nobody else wants to get close to people. That Jesus came for the people who dwell outside the camp. And whether it's the student that everybody loves to hate, and cyberbully who has to eat lunch alone in the cafeteria, uh, whether... It's the foster, whether it's the kid that by the time they're 18, they've lost count of how many foster homes and foster parents they've had because it's now in the double digits and their heart has been wrecked and their formation has been jacked up because of that. Whether it's the person who has been labeled the lifetime sex offender and you know, you look them up on their registry to make sure your house is not too close to them. You know, I think what we, our hearts cry out for our Creator to be like this. Like, like will God love me in that place where I feel most unacceptable? Where I feel most scared about who I am or I feel most wrong in the way I am or unworthy in how I am? Will He come to me with a love that is looking right at that and meets me right there in that spot? Right? It's where we might say to ourselves, if, if people just knew this about me, then they would want nothing to do with me. Or maybe it's that dark secret that I've kept and carried for years because I'm so afraid of what others would say or do or think if it ever came out. Perhaps it's some dirty habit that I have in the dark that would be so humiliating to try to confess to another person. Maybe it's an embarrassing weakness that we have and we've kind of ordered our life around trying to avoid the people and the places and the sorts of activities that have a way of bringing that weakness out. Perhaps it's the, the wound of rejection where you got branded unwanted, where you got branded unlovable by the, kind of, by the person or the people who are supposed to care for you and like be there for you and champion your cause. Uh, maybe it's the biggest mistake that you've made in your past that haunts you uh, at 2 a.m. in the morning when you're staring at the ceiling and you can't sleep. 
or it could be the scars of abuse where somebody did something to you that makes you feel cheap and dirty and worthless. Right? Like his love is not a generic love. His love is specific to those parts of our story. Like that's what his love is looking at and he's not a god who's scared off by that. But a god who who in Christ brings his transforming touch, his spiritual healing authority to some of the loneliest, most damaged or dark places inside of us. This is who Jesus is. Verse 4, And Jesus said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a proof to them or as a testimony to them. You know, as, as soon as Jesus performs a life-altering miracle on this man, he immediately starts thinking about the faith of the priests through the testimony of this man. It's like, hey, this miracle isn't just for you. <laughs> This miracle is also for the faith of the priests. And, you know, the priests had some very detailed protocols that they had to follow for reinstating a leper back into society. All sorts of washings and cleansings and sacrifices they had to offer to be able to look at a healed leper and say, yeah, you have been healed, and go through this big rigmarole to then pronounce them clean and fit for community covenant life again in community worship. Again, and I'm guessing, it was just me, I'm guessing that leprosy healings were very rare. And Jesus probably knows that they're very rare. And this guy's going to go to the priest, and the priest is like, yeah, I haven't done this one before. Let's go back and look up, look up what this is going to require of me. Right? They may have never performed this role before. I guess what I want you to just know is that Jesus is using this man to get the attention of the priest. Jesus is thinking about the faith of the priest. That the work of Christ in this man will be an invitation to the priest to come check Jesus out and investigate more deeply into who Christ is. This is and this is how God's grace and God's salvation works. Like, like when Jesus brings you to faith, in himself, you become a part of how he wants to bring others to faith in himself. Whether you know it or not, you're part of the mission now. <laughs> you just got commissioned in this mission of multiplying disciples. And God wants to use the grace that he gave to you as a means to bring his grace to somebody else. Right? Your, your redeemed relationship with God is not private. It's Personal, yes, but it's not private. It's not private. And you are part of how God wants to advertise His grace to other people. And, and, and I think a big part of our challenge is to always have this mindset that there are other people around me and connected to me that God is pursuing and He is part of and I am part, I am part of how he wants to pursue them. So already Jesus is thinking about the faith of, his, of the priest through his work in this man's life. And I think one of the biggest barriers to us ever seeing ourselves as, you know, as used of God is this kind of, you know, this false humility. Well, you know, just who am I, you know, and well, who is the leper? You know, I mean, like, like, let's get on the social spectrum. We've got two classes of people that couldn't be farther apart on, the, on two ends of the spectrum. You have the priests who are the power brokers of the day. They're at the top of the social food chain. And you can't find the, someone who's going to be like scraping the bottom of the so social food chain more than a leper. And who's being used to reach who? 
Because that's the way grace works. Everybody needs Jesus. And if everybody needs Jesus, then we can learn Jesus from anyone who's had a living encounter with Jesus. Now let me make one last point before we transition to communion. Um, In linking leprosy with ritual impurity, I, I believe God attached deep spiritual lessons to leprosy and just sort of made a symbolic picture out of the whole thing for the way sin separates us from God and separates us from one another because a leper was a the life of a leper was a cut off life cut off from horizontal relationships and in a sense cut off from temple-based covenantal worship. It was a cut-off life, and it's a very fitting picture for the way sin separates us from each other, puts barriers between me and you, and the way sin puts barriers between us and God. And if that's true, if I'm right about that, maybe I'm not, but I think I am. I wouldn't say it if I didn't think I was. But if I'm right about that, then I think this leper really teaches us something about how we come to God. Because this leper has humbled himself under what the Word of God says about him. God's Word pronounces this man ritually unclean. And he humbles himself under that as he comes to Christ. And we need to humble ourselves, guys, about what God's Word says about us that we are dead in our tracks spiritually, that we are dead in our trespasses and sin, that we are dirty in our sin, we are defiled, and that we are unfit for the presence of God, that we need to be cleansed, that we need to be made pure, that we need to be washed and white as snow uh, by the difference-making love of God that can change that up for us. You see, what you don't see the leper doing is, is, is and I'm, I'm going to start making a metaphorical point, if I can. What you don't see the leper doing is, is coming to Jesus and kneeling down and saying, Jesus, validate my leprosy. Jesus, affirm my leprosy. Say that I'm not really unclean. Like, call my leprosy by a new name. Like, call it blessed skin diversity. You know, um, tell me that I'm just right, just the way that I am. And see, and I'm bringing that up because that is the cultural moment that we find ourselves living in right now. And that may win you points with your cultural moment, but that gets you absolutely nowhere with God. It leaves you dead in your tracks Spiritually, I mean, that's the cultural moment we're in. We're expected to what? To validate everybody's preferences, to say, to affirm everyone's identities, and to approve of everybody's choices. And we may get somewhere with man doing that, but we will get absolutely nowhere with God when we do that. We have to humble ourselves under what God says about who we are and we have to humble ourselves under God's definitions of good and evil no matter how we feel to the contrary and so this leper models for us how we come to God Lord I'm not right but Lord you can make me right And Jesus went to the cross to make right what is wrong about you and I. And not just to die the death that we deserve, but to take all of our, all of sin's defilement onto himself and die in our defilement. That he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become 
the righteousness of God that we might be cleansed. There's both a penalty-paying aspect to the crucifixion, but there's also a cleansing aspect to the crucifixion. When God lays our sins onto his son and he dies in those sins and he sticks them in the grave and they're not yours anymore. They're gone. And we could be made new. 